what was your first campaign after leaving Birmingham and going and joining the SCLC staff? Well, that's when um, Andrew Young and Bevel and Dr. King and those got together and they bought us a white van. Uh, and in that white van, it was Andrew Marset, James Orange, and a young man that we call Sexy. I can't remember his name now, but we called him Sexy. The four of us, I think our first project was in Orange, Texas. I think there's a place called Orange, Texas, some part of Texas. Our contact person there was Barbara Jordan, the at attorney, Barbara Jordan. Yes. And very powerful woman. She smoked a tiny little pipe. I was intimidated by her initially. But she was our, t our contact person. She put us in touch with other members in the community who would uh, give us housing and a place to stay. And we did voter registration in, uh, in Texas. That was our first project. Was she actively involved in that or was she simply a contact person? Was she then in the, in the legislature? No, I guess she would not have been I, in the legislature. No, at that I, she early. was just a lawyer in, in, in that town at the time. I see. Uh, she was just our contact person. She was not actively involved in anything else that we were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but she put us in contact with those people who would assist us in whatever we needed. And she did make an impression. Oh, yes. Upon, Powerful yeah. woman. Yes, yes. Yes. And you mentioned Danville, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that experience because that seemed to have been, well Danville of course is very well noted for its, um, the educational process, really the defiance of education in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that for voter registration, that's, were you there for voter registration? For voter reg registration. Okay. But you know the interesting thing is <clears throat> I didn't find it as difficult in Danville as I did in Texas. Reason being, in Texas, we had to demonstrate, you know, rally the people together and, and demonstrate against some of our own people. Some of our own people who owned businesses in Texas, like barbecue places or whatever, who catered to the white population. What do you mean catered to them? Most of their service was geared toward the white population. Their feeling was these are the people with the money and that's what we're in business for is to make money. And for the most part, they did not serve black people. They did not serve black people in their establishments. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the people that we had to picket in Texas. Even though we were just there for voter registration, when we found these things going on, then of course we rallied some people together and we picketed our own people in order that, you know, that they understood where we were coming from. These are your brothers. You need to deal with them first. You, you know. had you had experience in selective buying in Birmingham. Yes. And did that experience uh, work for you in Texas? In yes. The same we way knew exactly what to do. We knew exactly what to do. We got together that night. We got our poster boards. We made up our signs. And by the time we finished, they were willing to serve anybody and everybody hmm. because people generally we're not going to cross those picket lines, you know. So you, you really then desegregated eating facilities in Texas in 63? Yes, yes. And many of these were, were, were black-owned businesses. Who were catering, catering to white to people. Whites. Exactly. That's, that's very interesting. Yes. Danville, Virginia was not that, we didn't, we, as a matter of fact, I can't remember any serious problems in Danville, Virginia. We were able to register our people. Um, I guess the, the only bad memory that I have of Danville, Virginia, I had gone back to Danville, Virginia when we got the news that Dr. King had been murdered. Mm -hmm. So that's the only bad experience or bad memory I have of Danville, Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, I have worse memories of a place called Plaquemine, Louisiana. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about that place, but that place was horrible. I, I know of the place. Tell me about the it, experience. At that time, it was still in the 60s, we had blacks living on plantations mm -hmm. there. Um, one plantation in particular, this white guy on the, plant, on the plantation, he had blacks living in little huts like with dirt flooring and they used the broom to sweep out the, the, outs, the inside of the house and the outside. 
and they would cook outside in the big black pots that you probably remember, you know, doing sure. the washing or whatever. They washed and cooked in the same pot. Well, Dr. King had to figure out a way to get these people off that plantation. And if I can remember correctly, what they did was they hired a helicopter and dropped handbills over onto that plantation. And I can remember hearing them say that there was one old black man on that plantation who could read. There were younger people there, yeah. but one old black man who could read, who read that handbill and mobilized the people on that plantation and brought them out to this, a mass meeting. This sounds like concentration camp. That's exactly what it was like. Exactly. And what were the meetings like when those people came to? Uh, they the were, we, we had some bad experiences there also. We, the meetings were held in a local Baptist church. Uh, this was a time when the police force taped up their badges and rode horses into the church in order to break up the mass meetings. The badges, of course, were taped so that we you know, could not identify who had done what. As a matter of fact, there was a little 13-year-old girl killed at one of those mass meetings because a policeman on the horse uh, forced, her, forced her into a dead-end uh, situation, mm -hmm. and the horse reared up and caved her chest in. Now, this is all in 1963. Mm, Sorry, 63, 63, 64 time frame, yes. Right. Um, if we are, uh, you've mentioned a number of places. And I wanted to ask you a question about Danville. You talked about being on the elevator and the policeman beating the young man. Mm -hmm. What were the circumstances of your being on the elevator with that policeman? He had been stopped uh, so on, on a bogus traffic uh, situation uh, and taken in. Uh, you know, like I say, we were considered rabble rousers. And you were in the, in, in the... I was in the car with okay. him. But you were in the, in the police department yes. on the elevator? Yes. And the elevator stopped? Well, he was, he was bringing us back down after they had done whatever, you know, that they had to do with him, and they were bringing us back down. Okay. And in, in bringing us back down, he stopped the elevator. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. okay. um, are there other occasions that sort of stand out in your mind in terms of your organizing for voter registration or whatever else may have been happening with the SCLC? I guess I probably hit on the most prevalent ones that tend to stand out. I guess the thing that really got away with me most was what happened to my friend in Danville, Virginia. Uh, some of the things that we encountered in Plaquemine Parish. Leandra, Leander Perez, I think, was the name of the state trooper. We used to call him the head head thumper or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, his guys showed no mercy to anybody. But Plaquemine Parish, Louisiana, uh, of course the Selma March, that right. was, um, that kind of stands out in my mind. But I was, um, I was a student again then. Right. I went back to school in 1964. Right, in yes. the fall of 64. Yes, I started at Tuskegee Institute. Okay, how did you, how was that transition from being in the field with SCLC back to the classroom? It was kind of hard initially to get um, acclimated to having to study all the time. And I felt so much older than many of my classmates, I suppose because of the experiences I had had. But at the same time, I realized that I did want an education. And then it got better because we organized a group on campus that we call TILE the Tuskegee Institute Advancement League. And we were a civil rights organization then uh, also. And I think um, several, Stokely Carmichael came to speak with us. Um, Jim Farmer came to speak with us. Very good friend of mine, Sammy Young, was killed in Tuskegee uh, as a result of some of our actions. Um, as a matter of fact, we found, later found out that some of the white people in Tuskegee had a hit list out. Sammy Young was the first on the list, then Wendell Paris, then Liz Fitz, then Betty Gamble, and a whole list of us that they intended to take out. Um, Sammy was just the first. 
very smart young man who had become a little bit too outspoken for the white populace in the area. All right. Yes. Malcolm X came to Tuskegee in just before he was assassinated, either January or February of 65. Do you remember that? I don't remember. Okay. His uh, being there. Yeah. I remember He's Stokely, I remember Farmer, I remember Foreman. Right. Um, because, you know, whenever these guys came to town, because sure. of the little organization that we had, we were always there with them. Right. So. Um, now, Sammy was also a member of SNCC, right? Yes. 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 Did you ever get involved with, with SNCC? No. Okay. No. Just, um, you know, whenever they would come to town, we were all, a, you know, the, sure. the same struggle. Right. So. But to join the organization, no, I was just a member of uh, SCLC. You then participated in the Selma March. Yes. Tell me more about that. It was long, it was tiring, it rained, it was very frightening again, because here again, um, the state troopers and all these people showed no mercy. Uh, I was not a part of, I was, you know, closer to the front. I was not a part of the people who uh, really got the, the the worst end of the situation. But, uh, you know, you have to sympathize and empathize with what's going on behind you mm -hmm. uh, because you've seen these kinds of things take place, you know, uh, before, so you know what's what's going to happen. You were there on Bloody Sunday? Yes, yes. And you, you, were, you were up front? Yes. But I didn't, get, I didn't get the the beatings for some reason like the rest of them did. I, I, I escaped that. I think the only really bad thing that ever happened to me was when they had the dogs in the water hoses here in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got hit with a fire hose, you know, a yeah. couple of times, but no dog ever bit me, mm -hmm. but I was a part of that. But the serious beatings and things of that nature, no, I never, mm -hmm. I never had to. What was the, you, with your participating in the Selma March, were there a large group of students from Tuskegee that participated? Yes. That yes. you all had organized? Mm -hmm. How did that organizational process take place on Tuskegee's campus? Uh, at that time, Tuskegee students were very interested in things of that nature. Uh, when Sammy was killed, it was very easy to mobilize the students around that cause because everybody knew Sammy, everybody loved Sammy. So it was very easy to mobilize students around that cause. Uh, for the uh, Selma, Selma March, uh, it was also, again, very easy to mobilize them around that march. We, we were able to get the auditorium. We were able to sell the students on what we wanted to do. As a matter of fact, we were even able to get buses in order to transport students. Dr. Foster was not necessarily in favor of. As a matter of fact, I can remember him calling us in as a group, those of us who were members of Tile. Uh, at, back in those days, girls were not allowed to wear pants on campus. We were not allowed to uh, ride in cars. You know, they had all these restrictions. So we broke a lot of things up at Tuskegee to the point where girls can now wear pants, girls can ride in cars, because we'd go in his office with our shoulder bags slung on our shoulders, wearing our jeans and our big t-shirts or whatever, and we would sit on top of desks in order, you know, not to conform to what he which, wanted us to do. Not, which was not ladylike. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, um, although he was not necessarily in favor of, of a lot of things that we were doing, uh, he went along with in many instances. He mm -hmm. didn't stop us. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember one demonstration we had. We got a telegram from A.G. Gaston. We were demonstrating. I think that was after the death of Sammy. We were all out in the streets demonstrating. And uh, A.G. Gaston sent us a telegram saying that we needed to be not in the streets, but back in our classrooms. Yeah. Of course, that didn't stop us either. Right. Yeah. There was a demonstration at Tuskegee where the students actually took over a building. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe the trustees were on campus at the time. Mm -hmm. And you, Dorothy Hall. Yes, and yes. Dorothy Hall. Were yes. you a part of that? Yes. Yeah. Every demonstration they had at Tuskegee, I was there. I was a part of it. Uh, even when we sat in in the streets, um, you know, uh, they had, um, they had the, the policemen to stop us midway between the campus and the downtown area. We were, we were headed to town. And uh, we simply sat in the street until they would allow us to pass. That's the time we got the telegram from A.G. Gaston. Uh, but yeah, every demonstration they had, I was a part of it.
especially if it had to do with uh, our rights as a people. So by 1968, they were glad to see you departing. Honestly. Not really. <laughs> I had mellowed out a lot. I had mellowed out a lot. Okay. I've made a lot of good friends down there, Mr. Woodson, people I still hear from. My youngest son attends Tuskegee, so I still get to see a lot of these people, Charles Chenier, mm -hmm. people who were there when I was there.